Charlotte Flow World Sports Show. I'm joined by James Galanis, coach of the U20 U.S. Women's National Team and also runs Universal Soccer Academy in New Jersey. Thank you for joining me, James. Uh, no problem, Charlie. Definitely an exciting time of the year, you know, for us that are, are fans of the women's game and just coaches in general with the Women's World Cup. It's It's been, I guess, a pleasure watching a World Cup that we don't have to wake up crazy times of the night or crazy times of the morning just to be able to watch it in our own time zone. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, no, it's been great uh, up to now. I've, I've, I've liked uh, what I've seen all the way through with, with all the teams. They've all showed, you know, attacking intent and, um, you know, it's been exciting and having it on the same, same time zone as us has been a, a bonus, definitely. Yeah, I've noticed that too with the aggression of a lot of teams going for goals, not being satisfied with with, with um, ties or 1-1s one or 0-0s. Zero it seems like teams that really want to get those three points and go through. Yeah, they all, it seems like nobody's got... Uh, got any fear there's nobody that's uh, really no one's bunkered yet nobody's um sat there and thought to themselves oh this is an inferior opponent and i'm going to sit back and absorb the pressure and see if we can scrounge out two three chances and maybe get a goal it's it, all the games have just been open um every team's just been been going for for the throat right from the first minute so it's been great we had a couple teams make their world cup debuts and it's hard to believe that We've never seen, you know, Spain. You know, they play Costa Rica. Both of them making their World Cup debuts, and I think Spain's a team that, you know, with a player like Vero can go pretty deep. And you had the luxury to see her when you coached in WPS. You know, what's a team like Spain you think could do? No, I think uh, Spain is just is Spanish football. It's uh, you know they they play as a team. They're, they're, the movement without the ball um, is what makes them special and. If you look at this team, they're, they're they're trying to implement what what the men do. Um, they're a, they're a good team that that works together. They defend together, they attack together, and then when you when you've got Bouquet, uh in the mix that you know has that individual brilliance, uh, they could definitely um, you know make make some noise at least. I'm I'm not sure if they're ready yet to go um, too too deep, but you never know. But um, Definitely great to watch. I think one thing that, that was talked about yesterday with the, the Spanish media, um, two of their major papers in Madrid, it, it put the you know women's national team for Spain on their cover. So, I mean, that's something, too. You've been working with women's soccer for years now. It's just starting to see the media support and just seeing the federations across the board now really support the women's game because a lot of these women – have to go train on their own privately, have to spend money out of their own pocket just you know to get field time or just to get their own boots. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just growing in 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 general right across um, across the world, and um, you know the the whole world is changing their stance towards um, towards women. Not in not in countries like Australia and the US, we we you know we're we're way more advanced than everybody else as far as trying to make everything equal. But you you know you find a lot of the European countries that you know would would look down on um, female soccer players in the past, they're actually um, starting to embrace it. And that's the same in South America as well. Um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, you know, if you were a female and you wanted to play soccer, you, you know, you you were like the odd one out. Um, there was something wrong with you. But now it's it's no longer the case. Um, the, the game, the women's game has been on TV. It's, it's had a little snip, little snippets here and there in the media, and I think that you know just the general fans have have sat down and, and watched a couple of games and thought to themselves, hmm, these women aren't too bad. Um, so it's kind of gaining uh, more and more interest, and it's just fantastic to see. I, uh, I mean, I can't imagine how big it's going to be in in, in 20 years. Can you imagine, um, you know, if it keeps going like this? Um, how big it is going to be. Yeah, I think it's one of the things where a lot of these, you know, players on the first couple World Cups, you know, they're going to, their kids are going to start being the ones playing. Where we're going to, you and I are going to watch World Cups, you know, 20 years from now and be like, oh, this is the daughter of such and such, you know, men's star, such and such women's star, because there is that option. 
And and I think that I think it's great because with the expansion of twenty four teams, you know, you really can reach out to the world. You know, eventually with the, the more teams involved, more teams have a shot at the World Cup. Because let's go back realistically back to the nineties, the there was probably only about two or three teams that could argue, hey, this team's gonna win the World Cup. And there are other teams that just just would not have a shot. Well, with this World Cup, you know, we've you talked about Nigeria being one of the dark horses that they've legitly said coming in, hey, our goal isn't just to, you know, get a few goals, get a win or two. We're here to win the World Cup. And I think that's every men's attitude is, hey, we're here to win a World Cup. And that attitude is starting to kind of go off on a lot of these teams that there's probably 10 teams that you could argue that have a shot at it. Oh, no doubt. Um, you, you're right on there, Charlie. There used to be, you know, two, three teams that, that, that had a chance. Um, and, you know, we saw with, with Japan in the, in the last World Cup, nobody expected that one. Um, they came out of nowhere and won it. Um, but, yeah, now you've got, you've got a whole range of teams that, that can win it. And not only that, believe that they can win it. I mean, you, you know, you've got, obviously you've got Japan, you've got, um, you've got the French, um, you've got the Swedes, uh, you've got the U.S., um, you've got obviously Germany. Um, yeah, there's 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 a number of teams now that that can win, and it's going to come down to that any given day method. Um, so it's great to see the competition's great, and um, you know nobody's afraid of anyone, and they're just going out there and trading blows. So it's been great. This past, you know, off season, I guess when, there's no such thing as off season when you're a trainer and you coach soccer. That that's the luxury of, of the, the game of soccer. That it is a kind of a year round thing. That the you know, player that you particularly started working with, Julie Johnston, you know, she's become, you know, a very very key role in U.S.'s midfield. I read something coming into the World Cup that U.S. is seven zero and two with her starting in the backfield, and she's a player that was kind of put on an injured reserve for the Concacaf qualifiers and. She'd come in and started working with you. What did you see out of her, and how did that all go down? Was it? I know it was something to do with Carter Lewis helped out with that. Yeah, just Julie. Um, Julie actually, her boyfriend is Zach Ertz, that plays for the Eagles football. So she was she was living in the area, and you know Carly was was telling her, hey, you should come out and and train, and um, you know eventually Julie decided to to, to come out. Um, and I had seen her. I'd seen her play in the U20 women's national team. Um, I had I'd seen her in the World Cup qualifying, and and I just noticed through her body language um, on the bench, it was kind of like uh, she was just there um, as a participant, and you know, not really pushing herself. Um, didn't look like a person that was really fully engaged, and I think she was. She had, she had the mindset of, you know, oh, they're grooming me and I'll probably end up playing sometime in the future once, you know, Rampone retires and um, after this cycle kind of a thing. So when she started working with me, I, um, you know, I started fixing her skills and and started talking to her um, mentally like I do with, with all my students and, um, you know, I, I, I was right on. I discovered a player that was kind of uh, just waiting for her turn. And I just said to her, look, Julie, you know, I don't know why you're waiting. Um, you're good enough to be playing in this team. Um, you need to go out there and and you need to treat every training session like it's a World Cup final and start making some noise of training and start showing your coaches that, you don't want to be a participant. You want to be in the 11. Um, so all credit to her. She, she changed her, her, her training approach um, while with the team. Um, she started making some noise. The, the coaches saw a difference in her game because we had sharpened up her skills as well. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, Rampone um, got injured and an opportunity presented itself. And she hopped right in. Um, and did a great job, and she got the nod again the next game, and um, and from there it just uh, just started flowing, and she scored goals for him, and um, she's playing great in the back, she's fearless, she's she's 
she gets stuck in. She's playing short balls out of the back. She's playing long balls out of the back. Um, and she's been a nice little piece in the in the back line over the last you know six seven months. So you know I was just able to help her skills. I you know I put her on a training on a on a physical program as well, and just basically changed the mindset. And she took it all in and she's changed the game. And here she is now. She's she's starting and doing well. I guess one thing is if you've got players like you know Johnson and you've got players like Lloyd that you know go through their ups and downs in their careers that. One of the big thing is 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 working with the player's mental aspect, and I think that that is one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is how important that is is to, is to keep a player mentally sharp. And I'm sure you've you've done that with Carly Lloyd when she had that thing in the 2000 and I guess it was 12 um, Olympics when she had come off the bench, and then she ends up being basically the player of the tournament. That you know how does that how do you approach that with players that you know maybe are down on themselves that that just need that little push. Yeah, look, um, the mind is everything. Um, at, the, at the highest level, um, all, every player is skilled. Every player knows the game. Every player is pretty much physically fit. Um, and when you get there, everyone's got those tools. So who are the ones that end up excelling? It's the ones with the, with the right mindset. And that's what I adjust and that's what I work on. So a lot of these pro players that I work on, work with, they, I fix their mind. That's the main thing. And that's what people don't realize. They think that, you know, it's all about the skills and getting fit and so on. Yeah, that helps. But at the, at the top, if you don't know how to think, um, you know, you're not going to make it. And, you know, I work with Julie, I work with Carly, um, I'm also working with Renee Cuella. She plays on the Mexican national team. Um, she's a mental job. I, I haven't, I've never even met her face to face, but I mentor her over the phone, and I've been able to get her back from injury, um, back in the in the squad. And yesterday, Mexico played their first game, and she started. Uh, the other one that I work on that, that I transformed it, her mind. Um, just to stick with the point of the mind, is Yureli Rincon. She's she's Colombia's best player. Um, she came to me over a year ago. Same thing, had the skills, knew the game. Physically, she needed work, um, but mentally, she didn't know how to think. So I readjusted her mind as well. She went back to World Cup qualifying, one player of the tournament for South America, and today... She's by far the, the best player in for Colombia and one of the best players um, in all of South America. So it's it's just the adjustment of the mind that you know I'm kind of tweaking on these players that's making a big difference. And you're right, it's 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 the mind, it's the mindset is everything, especially up at the top. And the problem is that these tools aren't being taught at a young age. See, a lot of these kids are coming to me, um, you know, with with bad bad mindsets, and it's because they had a coach or coaches that ignored the character issues that the players had or the mental weaknesses that the players had because they didn't want to make them angry and have them sit the bench because there was a character flaw that, that came up or because they were weak, mentally weak in the game. They won't sit there and say, look, you know, uh, I didn't like, I didn't like that you back chatted to the referee or, or you were nasty to one of your teammates in the last game. So guess what? You're sitting the bench for the next two games because that's not acceptable on this team. Coaches would ignore that, for example. So the, these players would build bad mental toughness skills and character skills. So they get to me at the highest level and I'm fixing what their youth coaches fail to fix. Because the mind is everything, as you said, Charlie. Yeah, I think the, the neat part about when you do the training is you're focusing more on the individual where sometimes in, in soccer when you're doing the coaching of a, of a team, I've talked to several coaches and, and had this debate, and, and a lot of the trainers that do stuff like I do the training too, where I train a lot of individuals and I train teams. So a lot of it is just getting my players mentally sharp for their Saturday, Sunday game. But 
I've said it, I've heard a lot of saying is there's like the European approach where we're here to develop players. When you look at a lot of the European academies and the academies that are underneath a, a larger team like a PSG or a Chelsea or a Man U, that they're here to develop the players. And, and you know, the, the head coach will go to the academy and say, hey, I need a sharp, you know, center back. I need a sharp, you know, winger. I need a sharp blah, blah, blah player where in America – you have so many different clubs that have their own agenda, and their agenda is to win cups, is is to is to you know ho- hoist trophies and get medals. Where sometimes they neglect the individual brilliance. Where in Europe, and in your case, is you're you're here to build an individual, and if you have a bunch of strong individuals, that's why, you know, a lot of these European teams are winning World Cups because they have strong individuals. Yeah, you're right on there. Um, you know. They don't worry about winning um, in Europe or in in South America. Sure, they want to win. They, they, their goal is when they go out there. Their, their goal is to win. Once you get to Sunday, your goal is to win. Yeah. Okay. But but the reality is they see the big picture that they're developing the individuals and they're developing the team. Okay. And that's something that we're not doing here. Here, all we're worried about it's all focused on winning so what happens is for example say we've got a u10 tryout at the at our at one of these big clubs um you know a big strong athletic kid shows up that is just happens to be at 10 years old is is much bigger than everybody else and you can launch a long ball to him and just gonna sprint and bulldoze his way through the rest of the little 10 year olds and score a goal, but has no skill, um, has no game sense, and doesn't really love the game because they're also playing baseball, they're also playing basketball, they're they're also playing lacrosse, and they're just a a, a, a gifted athlete that is a multi-sporter kid, you know. And then you've got another kid that shows up to to tryouts at the same age group that is really little, smallest guy there, but loves the game. That's all he does. Kicks the ball up against the wall at home, has a good touch, um, plays with his friends on the street, um, and lives and breathes the game and doesn't want to do anything else. Well, that kid will get neglected. That kid won't make it. Oh, it's too small. I'm not going to win with him today. So they won't even bother taking him. Um, You know, it's the same with, um, that's on an individual as far as recruiting process I'm talking so, talking about. So we're talking about the selection of the teams right now. That's that's what I pointed out. Then once you, you do create the team, and I'll stick to the 10-year-old age, if, if you want to develop your players properly, you know, you've got to work on the skills, making sure that they're comfortable with the ball. And then when they do play the game, you, you've got to be willing to lose. You, if you want to play the right way, your goalkeeper, when your goalkeeper's got the ball, you, you gotta, you're you going to have to roll it out. You can't just punt it. You're going to have to roll it out. And your little 10-year-olds, they're gonna, they, you've got to stay with them and you've got to be patient while they're trying to bring the ball out of the back, into the midfield, into the forward line. Well, the reality is, at 10 years old, in a whole season, they're probably going to get caught out, let's just say, 50 times. And they're going to lose games, and they're going to lose a lot of them. And you've got to be, stick with them. And then you go down to U11, and now you keep rolling the ball out, and now they're going to lose the ball 35 times. But you're still going to be losing. Then you're going to go to U12, and you're going to roll the ball out, and now you're going to get caught out 20 times. And you might be in the middle of the pack then. Then you go to U14, and it's 10 times, and now you're probably on top of the pack and you're playing the right way. Then you go to U15, now they're really good at it, no one can stop them, and now you've built yourself a good team. But the point is, nobody's willing to go, or not nobody, there's a, most coaches aren't willing to go through those hard times to get to that point, to build those soccer players that know how to think that have the skill, they know what to do without the ball. Uh, through those all those years, the 10-year-old phase, the 11-year-old phase, the 12-year-old phase, and so on. Because they're all worried about 
um, their own coaching resume, a lot of them. And a lot of them are just simply afraid of, of the parents because parents are going to come up and they're going to start jumping ship and say, well, we didn't win a game last year. We lost every game. Well, if you want me to develop your kid properly, then you've got to be willing to lose. And this is the problem that we have here in the U.S., that everything is, is based around winning. We, we measure success at the young ages based on winning. But really, we should be measuring success around are our kids juggling the ball better? Are they dribbling it better? Are, they, are their foot skills better? Are they receiving it better? Are they passing better? Are they shooting better? Are they working as a unit? Are they moving off the ball to be available? Are they creating a, a, a good angles and shutting down the opponent um, and trying to deny... These are the things that, that we should be measuring success on with in the youth ages, and that's not what we're not doing. And this is the problem. So when you go overseas... First of all, most of the games are all 5v5. And a lot of the, 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 the leagues around the world, they don't even have scores till they're about U13, U14. And the parents are educated and they will applaud loudly a piece of individual skill. So if they see a kid, for example, do this unbelievable piece of skill where fakes a couple of people out and passes a nice, beautiful through ball to somebody, the crowd will the parents will applaud. But if they see some kid that just launches the ball from the halfway line, shuts his eyes, launches it, and skies it over the little goalkeeper that's sitting in the goal, launches it over their hands, they're not going to applaud. Although it was a goal. Because they're more educated and they get the big picture because they've obviously been involved in the game longer. So this is the problem that we've got here in, in the U.S., that we're not developing our players properly. And there's clubs that are emerging and there's all these super clubs that are out there that, um, that their whole philosophy is um, to win because they win, then parents want to join and parents think I'm going to a winning team so they pay big bucks for that, but really the kids aren't learning the right way and the kids aren't really getting ready for the international level or the highest level. So yeah, we've got a that. lot of work to do at a youth level at the youth level here. Now a lot of those things that you you've said I I've dealt with personally in the trainings where I, I did the um a couple of different of those you because I'm a trainer for a couple of different local clubs in the Philadelphia area and. You know, come in mm -hmm. like you know, you to work with the teams and make them better. But you know, you you give the coaches that may have not that much experience, education, and advice on how to manage a team and how to manage players, and then it, it falls. You feel like it falls on deaf ears because when you we'll go to these these combine things, you know, these evaluation things. To me, I really think they're a joke because of the way the coaches are all holding their clipboards evaluating and and they're looking for the fastest player, the quickest guy who can shoot the hardest, who can shoot the fastest. So it, it's such a hard thing to quantify a soccer skill and a rating thing. You know, it's like, you know, you'll have a checklist. Oh, this kid, oh, he's a 10 on speed. And, you know, I'm looking for different things. I'm looking for that kid in game action. I want to see a kid in a 3v3 or 4v4, or like you said, or 5v5. How does he or she handle themselves in game action? Because, yeah, that kid may be fast without the ball or with the ball, but how fast is he when he has pressure on him? You know, there's so many of these kids – yeah, he might be able to run right. 50 miles an hour with the ball, but what happens if you put a defender next to him or, or, or chasing him? And those are the things that that are very frustrating. And then you said you do have the kids that are multi-sport. you know, sport That I, I trained a team three times a week and only one time a week, couple of my half, I, I'd say probably about 30% of the kids played other sports. So only I remember one day of the three days I'd have my full, you know, 13 team, you know, players, every every player on this U8, um, U10 team, 8v8. So it's very hard as a trainer and coach to implement plays and, and, and understand the flow of the game when you only have these kids once a week. That's right. That's a big problem too. And that's the, that's the other thing that's different to compared to countries overseas. Like I, I grew up in Australia, obviously, 
Um, and we had Australian rules football. We had cricket. Um, we had soccer. We had tennis. Um, you know, we had basketball as well. And you were something. You weren't everything. So when people come up to you, they would, they would ask you, you know, what are you? And you'd say, oh, I'm a soccer player. I'm a basketball player. I'm an Australian rules player. I'm a rugby player. You weren't everything. Now, sure, you played everything on the street. You know, well, I played everything on the street. I played cricket. I played yeah. Australian rules football. I played tennis. Um, but soccer was my sport. That's the sport that I played competitively at. That's the sport that I was focused on. Here, we, we got kids that are trying to be the best at everything. And first of all, it's impossible to do because now you just become sort of very good at everything and great at nothing. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, parents being addicted to watching their kid do well. Um, you know, so if you've got a kid that's really tal- talented and is good at all sports, yeah, at, 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 the, at your town, in your town, if your kid's a great athlete, he's going to be the best basketball player, the best soccer player, and the best football player. Well done. Yes, we know that. There's some athletically gifted kids that can do that. But at some point, if your kid keeps excelling and keeps going and reaches the top, you're going to meet the rest of the, the kids from around the country or the, around the region that are just as athletically gifted as your kids. But if those kids put in more hours in that particular sport, they're going to whoop your kid. So basically, yeah, you're getting all this satisfaction by then beating your, 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 your little local area, which is great, but they're not really getting better for the top. If you want to get better for the top, you need to specialise. And I'm not saying from a really, really young age, but you need to specialise at some point. And that's the problem that a lot of people, you know, they don't even specialise at all. They think that they can just bounce around to every sport all the way to 18 years old. And you can't do that. No, I totally agree. You want to be the best. That, that, that's probably one of my, my biggest issues is that is taking the focus away from the sport. I think the one that really irks me the most is is having a kid play multiple sports in the same season and a juggling, you know, where you're, you're missing all my practices and it's not my decision as a trainer to bench kids or not bench kids and it's not the kid's fault that mom or dad has signed them up for two sports. But my biggest thing was, yeah, it was this fall was or this spring is half the team plays you know baseball their half plays the lacrosse and the other team you know so it's it's one of those is as a, as a coach if i was coaching it's like you've got to pick one or the other you know you you can't come here but the problem is it's politics of the parents too that some of these parents of these clubs are very wealthy and they pay a lot of money to be in a club and they think that hey well i paid just as much as kids johnny and, and, and whatever julie i paid the same amount of money as them my kid deserves to start so there's that political pressure and then they say well well fine i'll go i'll go play for this club down the street i'll go play for the competition because they'll allow me to only practice once a week and i'll, I'll pay to play for them so i think that all goes back to the clubs not necessarily working together much and almost working against each other and it's actually really hurting u.s soccer that's right it is hurting and 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 this is the problem i mean you know let's just talk about you know these long weekends are all tournament weekends, you know, Memorial Day, for example, that's a huge tournament weekend. So if you're a multi-sporter kid, okay, that's, that's playing multiple sports, now you're going to have to let down one of your teams Yep. by not being there. So if you're playing baseball and you've got a tournament, your baseball team decides to go to Maryland and your soccer team's playing in, in up here in North Jersey, for example, where are you going to go? So either one you pick, you're, you're letting down your team. Now, if you've got four or five of these kids that are doing the same thing, you go to the tournament and all of a sudden you don't have enough players to play or you're playing with 11. So who, what are you doing? You're hurting, your, you're hurting the kids that love the game. And this is the problem. So, yeah, look, Charlie, at the, at the youth level, there's so many things that... that that we are doing wrong here. I'm not saying myself personally. I, I, I think I, I've actually got a, a great program that I run. Um, I'm, I'm 
I educate my parents. I have great parents. I don't have these issues. My parents are fully on board with what I'm doing. Um, I screen every kid to make sure that they that they're soccer junkies, and I just choose to to, to pick to to work with the ones that that love the sport. If you're if you're a multi sporter, uh, I'm not judging you. It's not that I think you're doing something wrong, but I'm not interested in kids that aren't sure of what they're doing or they're trying to be the best at everything. I'm interested in just kids that that have identified that soccer is my passion and this is what I love to do. And I work with them and it's it, it's very rewarding to me. I I work for my kids and my kids sense it and that's why they excel. But I look around and that's just me and I'm sure there's other people scattered throughout the country that are doing the same thing. But overall, the other 95% um, aren't operating this way. So when we get kids that now are going to the national youth team programs, you know, both on the men's and the women's side, your U15 team, national team, U16, and so on, we're not getting the same quality player that we used to get 15, 20 years ago. You would think with all the resources that we've got today that our players are better at the top, but really they're not. Um, and this is because of all the reasons that we stated here today, everything from um, recruiting the, the, the wrong players, everything from, from everything is driven about with, um, with money and, and, and winning rather than, than development. And then you've got kids that are scattered play, playing multiple sports and we don't, we're not able to get as many, as many kids as we should just specializing on soccer. I want to change the page a little bit and go to your coaching now with the U.S. Uh, women under 20. Now, have you noticed any – are there any differences when you bring in these U-20 players? They're the, the cream of the crop. So a lot of these are those type of players that have, you know, now have to put all their focus on the soccer, you know. So, I mean, w- what has that experience been like working with U.S. soccer? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm working as an assistant coach um, for, the, for the U-20s so far. Um, the experience has been great. Um, I mean, what I can tell you right now that um, what U.S. soccer is, is, is doing uh, for the national youth teams um, is outstanding. Um, you know, I wasn't sure before. I, I wondered, you know, um, what are they doing up there? Because there has been a little bit of a decline on our, uh, in our national um, youth teams um, at the international level. So I, I was wondering, like, you know, what are they doing that's different compared to back in the day? But um, after going up there and, and seeing what they're doing, they're, they're actually doing an outstanding job. Uh, the training that, that they're providing for these kids is, is first class. Um, the environment that they're, they're providing, the, the professionalism behind um, behind everything they're doing is it's incredible. It's really fantastic. Um, now, the, the issue is not what they're doing at the top. The issue is, you know, the players that are coming through the system, the cattle that's coming through the system. Um, it's not as great as what you would expect, um, and it's not as great as what it, what it used to be. Um, and you know, it goes back to the change in the landscape of of the youth game, like all the points that we just brought up. I don't want to bring them up again, um, but all the points that, that we just brought up about winning first, development second, and the recruiting process and, and all that, you know, it's, it's hurting. Um, or it, uh, yeah, hurting is the word. It's hurting uh, the, the, the amount of quality players that are coming through the system um, into the U20s, U19s, U16s, and and so on. The U20s that I've worked with, they're fabulous. They're, they're a great bunch um, of players. I mean, they're, they're great. Um, but from just from speaking from other people that are in the system, you know, they're they're not they're satisfied with the players that are coming through. But I don't think they're, they're thrilled with them. They they know that things need to improve um, at the youth level, at the club level. Um, so 
the experience has been great and it's just been great to be able to just go up there and see that US soccer is doing a great job and and you know we just need to keep you know changing things at the at the bottom and make sure that the players that we're getting at those national team levels are better than what we are really getting I want to thank you again coach James Lance for your time appreciate everything you do for just the game and especially the women's game and it, 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 your name got mentioned quite a few times during a broadcast yesterday when um, a couple of the game, I think it was the the, the Sweden game, one uh, not Sweden game, the Swiss game, the Switzerland, there was a player that you worked with in Atlanta. So I guess that, that takes it back a little bit. That it's, it's good to see that a lot of your products are on the field and excelling, and I'm sure that, that, that makes it fun and interesting to watch the game, especially when you have pupils versus pupils that you can't really pick a side when you have players going against each other. It's been great. I mean, you know... I love all the players that I've worked with and the players that I'm currently working with. And, you know, I, I cheer for all of them. Um, you know, they're, they're, I know these players personally and I know what the what the women in general, um, what they go through to get to this level. And it's not easy. They, you know, the sacrifice that they have to make, the, the work that they have to put in, the politics that they have to deal with. And the, the players that you're seeing that are, that are in this World Cup, all of them have a story that is littered with ups and downs and, and you know, just challenges that they've overcome to get there. So I admire every single one of them and um, I'm cheering on all of them. Um, obviously, I want uh, the U.S. to win the whole thing, um, but, you know, I just love watching all of them play. Again, thank you for your time, James. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie.